Day number five. Here we go. Today, um, you're going to be doing some characterization of cells in the basal state, pluripotency, human cells, and um, observing some of the, the cells you prepared during the week. So I'm going to give an hour-ish, or so, however long it takes, uh, lecture on some of the ways uh, historically people have characterized these cells, whether to call them pluripotent or not. Part of, and that'll lead into Marianne going over some slides of the stainings you'll be doing today to characterize the cells. And then we have a happy hour this afternoon mm -hmm. where uh, I'll see you again then and we'll be hanging out. You can ask me all the questions that have built up over the week. Hopefully you've learned a little bit from the combination of morning lectures from uh, telling about the reprogramming to the basal pluripotency and leaving pluripotency through gastrulation of how to differentiate, introducing you to the concept of directed differentiation that then should have been followed up in detail with pictures by Finn, and then leading into some of the initial actual hands-on techniques you've practiced, not only for working with blood that you could reprogram, growing cells in the undifferentiated state, but especially having them exit pluripotency in a directed differentiation way to gastrate through pelvic streak to endoderm, practicing some or some of the markers, so you could CXCR4 to monitor your endoderm, and then watching them as they go on to specify to lung, including the NKX GFP reporter. Finn introduced you to, and hopefully you'll see that reporter when? When do, when do they see the reporter? Today? Okay. And um, once the cells have become lung, you know, you leave them in medias and various medias that we're developing to find their way to either proximalize or distalize. So, I think most of the students expect by the end of the week they can go home, start making mature type 2 pneumocytes, everything's going to be fine, and you know, that's not the way it works. And actually, uh, the, on purpose, the course is not to teach how to make advanced mature end stage recipes because if there's one thing, hopefully it's come through clearly all week, it's that everything, everything in terms of efficiency, how your cells behave and how they mature depends much more on the first two weeks than the last three, four, five weeks. Everything is about the day zero cells being really pluripotent, competent to gastrulate, and then about the endoderm being efficient in a scored, measurable way, see kit CXCR4 with some pattern recognition, and then some monitoring of the cell fate decision to commit to lung, as exemplified by NCAX 2.1 GFP. In our experience, that's the hardest part of the protocol is endoderm to lung, how to plate them into matri gel drops, drops to have them leave. And after that, it's mostly just time and some media tricks, but the, the, it's those, those stages are much more easier and they're entirely dependent on the first two weeks. Okay, message received. So let's talk about day zero then. How will you know if your cells are any good to start making lung? You're about to invest a month or six weeks of your time taking these beautiful cells and taking them all, I mean, to recapitulate developmental biology as we're emphasizing to is really hard. That's directed differentiation. How do you know if the cells are any good on day zero that you should even start or throw them out, start over, thaw another vial? So question one, conceptually, <clears throat> here's your somatic cell Gustavo talked to you about. It's differentiated. It's different than this stem cell we're working with. Pluripotent stem cell of two flavors we've talked about, embryonic stem cells and their near equivalent that's engineered by reprogramming induced pluripotent stem cells, very similar if not identical. Now if I give you a vial of pluripotent stem cells, and trust me, it's a, I want you to believe it's pluripotent, you shouldn't trust me of course, so you're going to find out for yourself, let's say I give you a vial of pluripotent stem cells, how will you find out for yourselves if these are pluripotent stem cells? That's the philosophical question. So what do you think? Here's a vial of pluripotent stem cells. Trust me. How are you going to find out that I'm telling that you can trust me? Yeah, if you can uh, differentiate them into the different um, endoderm, mesoderm, all the different germ layers. Germ layers. So okay. Possible. Great. So, so you just brought up the key criteria, which is function, isn't it? That's how you measure a pluripotent stem cell. Any other ideas? Any other guesses? This is a vial of pluripotent stem cells. Is this good enough? You think that's well, good enough? The three germ layers. Okay. You also need to show that it can self renew as well, right? Okay. Yeah. Self renewing and having multipotent or pluripotent, if it's across germ layers, differentiation repertoire would be the key. Okay. Um, 
How about markers? How about genomes, transcriptomes? These are, so these are the questions we ask and the field asks is how do you know if cells really pluripotent? And this is, a, this is a good answer. So let's just go through historically how people studied pluripotent stem cells and how you're gonna characterize them today and what the different levels or stringencies of, of characterization are to meet you know, the right to call a cell pluripotent. All right, so <clears throat> what we're talking to you today about is um, markers of taking human cells and staining them with this kit Marianne will introduce you to. And they're uh, markers, cell surface markers, SSCA1, 3, and 4, antibodies against which um, that are con fluorescently conjugated she'll introduce you to. There's an alkaline phosphatase, uh, which you would not practice today, but this is another typical technique used in the field. And some other cell surface markers, TRA-161, TRA-180. So when you stain for this panel of either enzymatic function or cell surface markers in human uh, ES cells or IPS cells, Either way, they're, they're very similar. They will be positive for everything except SSCA1. Okay, so here you go. These are positive. In the literature, it was a TRA-180 that was Torsten's published marker for reprogramming, or 161? 161. 161. So early in the field, uh, we don't find this much, but early in the field, so everybody clear? Human embryonic stem cells stain positively for all these markers and they stain negatively for SSCA1, which will upregulate as cells differentiate. But in mouse cells, remember we talked uh, earlier in the week about mouse cells having a slightly different basal pluripotency state than human and slight other differences, in the hu including shape. And the human cells actually, uh, the mouse cells are positive for SSCA1, whereas the human cells are negative. So this is a nice kit Marianne will run you through because if you include SSCA1 antibody, it should be negative. So that's a nice negative control that you're not just studying autofluorescent artifacts and nonspecific binding, that some of the markers are positive, some of them, and one of the markers is negative. Now, early in the reprogramming field, it was recognized that not all colonies were pretty in, in human reprogramming of fibroblasts to pluripotency to make iPS cells. And in fact, uh, and labs like uh, Catherine Plath's started to do global transcriptomic profiling of the different types of colonies that were emerge in culture. And Rudolf Jenisch has tracked the kinetics of how somatic cells reprogram over time into iPS cells. And what emerged in the literature was the contention that not, firstly, the first observation was if you put Stemka or whatever, Sendai, whatever four Yamanaka factors into any somatic cell, chances are it doesn't reprogram, right? There's certain blocks on reprogramming, and so broadly over a culture dish of a million cells, maybe only 1% of them reach reprogramming. It doesn't mean the others do nothing. Some of them do very little. Some of them go partially there or lose their way or uh, recede backwards then to this fibroblastic state. Or some of them actually reach a self-sustaining different morphology with roundedness, but they don't quite reach IPS pluripotency. So what emerged in the literature was the concept that there were these partials. So there's kind of true reprogrammed IPS colonies and some that didn't find their way all the way there, which is a complex construct of what is a partial. Is it something that occurs in nature? Probably it's not. Probably it's something artificially engineered that is unnatural that there are all these different basal states beyond pluripotency that you can arrive at that nature never arrives at, but that you can arrive at if you really force a cell to overexpress the four Yamanaka factors. So, yes, what's that? Other way? 160, try 181. Try 181 and, and 160. 160 is the one that is the I, always, I always get that confused. Yeah, 181. So the partials is? The partials in the DNA. So ta, the claim was that try 160 really is the one that identifies, separates the partial from the. So the real one is try 160 positive. That one. Okay, everybody got this? I've made a mistake already. 160, 181 are the, are the TRA markers. Okay, so back to the concept of partials here. So early in the field it emerged that you could tell the difference between partials and true IPS cells based on some of the cells being weakly positive for 160 that tracked with the partials. Okay, so, so I guess not all the markers are equally interpreted and we do a panel and we'd like the cells to 
to stain positively for a broad panel of markers, and then there's particular emphasis placed on 160 from one paper early in the, in the literature. And SSCA1 should be negative in human cells, po uh, positive in mouse cells. Okay. So, do markers tell that you're pluripotent? No, I think this is kind of the lowest level of pluripotency. We know that fibroblasts shouldn't be, or blood cells shouldn't be expressing all these markers, but really function, your answer is a much better functional test of the cells. So if they're not expressing these markers, we, we have very little confidence that we can go on to functional testing, but if they express all the markers, they're ready for really proving they're pluripotent functionally. Can I add one thing, Ms. Brown? I think it's fair to say that many of the of the reports or cases that dealt with partial reprogramming was most likely directly correlated with the technology that was used. And and is I think for quite some time now we feel more confident than most techniques that people use today. It's very rare to find partial reprogramming. Is that correct, Marianne? Or do I mean, in the dish, I see, I still see partial reprogramming. You see, you see funny partial. shapes, yeah. yeah. But we don't pick those funny shapes no. and go on to profile them. So by the time we pick a pretty colony, right. it uh, oh, yeah, usually co-expresses yeah. these markers. And we're not really finding tra 160 negative colonies because you're picking the, right. you're not picking oh, the ugly shapes, in right? General, in general, it's very rare that you will pick colonies and expand, and they will grow, and they will passage and there will be partial reprogram lines uh, that they don't yeah, work properly. But for yeah. sure you see some of the picked colonies look ugly or too pretty or not quite right and we, and we think uh, we don't spend much time anymore characterizing them. Those are probably wrong cells including partials. So most of the ones we characterize, almost all the ones we characterize, we don't really find cells lacking this marker or partials anymore. To, to ex expand on what Gustav is saying, early in the field when you're using four retros, four separate Yamanaka factors, and maybe some of the cells are getting only three or two of the factors. There's a lot of, and they're getting them in different stoichiometries and different copy numbers. There's a lot more propensity to have uh, even pretty colonies be not quite right. Now the stoichiometry is very worked out. All the cells are getting uh, the four factors, and, uh, and uh, the morphologies that are correct at once picked and characterized seem not to be fraught with too many partials. Okay, alkaline phosphatase is an enzyme that's not specific to pluripotent stem cells. It's expressed in high levels at different places in the body, including the intestine. However, the observation is in that in this particular model system, whether you're using mouse or human ES cells in this particular state, they are high in expression of this gene, protein, enzyme, alkaline phosphatase, and they immediately lose expression of this marker, drops like a stone as soon as they differentiate even a little bit. So it's a popular and easy enzymatic assay. We're not doing this today, alkaline phosphatase, but um, it's a classic mouse kind of, uh, if you have a mouse ES colony, you can find colonies that are half alkaline phosphatase bright and half uh, faint. They've lost it, and you could notice that the edge of a colony is kind of uh, irregular as if it's differentiating, and this is a very nice way to score pluripotency. We talked to you about uh, two I medias of Austin Smith that brings the mouse cells that you know, might not be behaving quite right really back to the basal pluripotent naive state. Those cells are perfectly 100% uniform for alkaline phosphatase. It's, they're stunningly pretty, beautiful, and bright for alkaline phosphatase. But in most normal uh, mouse ES cell cultures that are not dependent on naive cells or pluripotency, we tend to have a score of about 90% good colonies, alkaline phosphatase bright, nice colonies, and in those non-2i conditions, a little bit of differentiation, 10%, a little bit of ugliness, is actually reassuring to us. It's not bad. Why? Because as you culture these cells, they can form some karyotypic instabilities. So these are amazingly stable cells. These are not like fibroblasts or your somatic cells that can be very karyotypically or genetically unstable. They have a tremendous amounts of machinery to preserve the genome being expressed, so they, that's why they're so stable. And yet, one in a million cells in a dish forming a classic trisomy that the cells could form gives, endows the cell with a proliferative advantage. And like weeds over a few passages, that trisomy 
whether this is mouse or human, same thing happens, will take over the culture dish. And when it happens, those beautiful plurif plur those colonies that are abnormal, that are trisomies that have, or other genetic abnormalities that are picked up on G-banding, carry typic analysis, uh, are, they tend to be, we've observed, very pretty. They're perfectly round, absolutely beautiful, they grow fast, every beginner wants to pick them, so when your trainee comes in your lab and they're reprogramming, the first thing to teach them is don't go for the juiciest, best, fastest growing colony because it's usually a trisomy. Just pick a diversity of colonies and you have to check the karyotypes. If you do an alkaline phosphatase stain and you're not in 2i media, cells are growing fast, perfectly round, 100% positive for alkaline phosphatase, that's a dead giveaway you're dealing with a karyotypic abnormality or trisomy, okay? We like a little differentiation, it's not bad unless you're in these advanced 2i medias, which also have a little karyotypic instability in our experience, but unless you're in those 2i medias where the cells really look perfect, we like a little bit of differentiation, it's reassuring. But the only way to check you have a normal karyotype is to, to check it, G-banding, or uh, these days you can look on Illumina chips too to see if there's copy number variations or chromosomal duplications, etc. Okay, message received, this is just part of um, quality control for your cells on day zero that you're working with because when you're doing long differentiation you don't want to spend four years of your graduate student's time differentiating a cell with a trisomy. Marianne has a, uh, you put the protocol in about freezing, archiving new vials. Is that in the document? It's not in the documents? We have So Marianne's practice and most cores practice is just general banking good practices that you take an early passage line that you want to work with and she freezes down two lots of 10, 10 vials and then she freezes down a couple of passages later another 10 so she has two 10 vial stocks one at an early passage let's say it's passage 8 one at a later passage let's say it's passage 12 okay and this is sent out for G banding analysis and it's also thawed to make sure the stocks are good and this is, and of course it needs to be mycoplasma negative, very important. So these QAs are done so that everybody in the lab is working with vials you know to be karyotypically normal. Okay, and then when the, the working stock is depleted, she thaws the next vial and replenishes the working stock so the archives last a long time. And the archives have a normal karyotype within a passage. The common mistake made in most labs is you're very excited, you've got your new line, and you start to set, spread it all around the lab. And then you give it to whoever's archiving, and they do G-banding analysis and maybe do the freeze. And uh, they do the G-banding analysis too early, and they don't have enough cells, and so they're freezing down stocks that are 10 passages later, and the other graduate student is working with the passage 40 line, and the other one with the passage 60 line. And before you know it, they're freaking out because somebody sends a karyotype and it's abnormal and everybody in the lab panics. But most people in the lab, if they're working with the early passage cells, actually do have normal karyotypes. So it's best to karyotype early, get your stocks, hand out karyotypically normal cells. Everybody in the lab then starts with the normal karyotype even though they will drift over time. Okay, brand new nature paper out from uh, Kevin Egan's lab says that the more you, pa we know the more you passage, the more trisomies you get or G-banding abnormalities with the growth advantage, but he's picking up in a brand new nature paper now that if he surveys the cells across the world of advanced passages, they're also taking, picking up very subtle base pair changes such as in genes that encode P53 that he can pick up by sequencing that also might give a proliferative advantage. So it's complex here, but I think that's a brand new paper that's nuanced. The baseline is everybody should work with a G-banded cell line that is archived at the passage that's close to the, the karyotyping. All right, let's get back to whether the cells are pluripotent or not. So these markers are just quality checks, one of which may have some more importance in excluding uh, whether it's likely to be a partial, partially reprogrammed clone or not, but they don't prove that the cells are pluripotent. Markers are not enough. How about some other classic genes? If they've reactivated the OCT4 endogenous locus, or other highly specific transcription factors that include pluripotency, NANOG, SOX2, KLF4 are part of the, you know, so SOX2, KLF4 are nonspecific, they're all over the body, so we tend not to use those as markers. But these are pretty specific, OCT4, NANOG, most cells in the body 
don't express those transcription factors. So if they're expressing these on an immunostain, it's like these markers. It's just support of evidence, but not proof of pluripotency. If they're lacking in OCT4, that's a bad sign, right? You can't be marker positive, lack the key transcription factor, and call that cell pluripotent. So negative studies help, negative stains. Positive studies are just supportive. They don't prove pluripotency. Nanog is interesting, and if you're not in a naive cell in this 2i media, most, uh, it was known for many years from Austin Smith, Smith's papers that mouse ES colonies that are perfectly good and have germline competence are wobbling around with half the cells being nanog negative, or uh, for nanog GFP reporters in there, negative, or having monolelic expression, uh, or, or half the cells being positive, and those cells go back and forth between uh, the nanog alleles uh, reactivating. So you can split them up by sorting, replate them, and they swap back and forth. Nanog negative turns positive and vice versa. Okay, so uh, what I'm describing to you are just markers that don't prove pluripotency. So what proves pluripotency? Well, the pluripotent cell probably has a transcriptional network that's very unique. So the whole genetic program of the cells. So we're gonna say uh, characterization is what we're talking about. One, we've talked about some markers that being the lowest level of suggesting a cell is pluripotent. Two, now we're talking about the, uh, <coughs> the programs of the cell. The first program being the transcriptomic net program or network. If we can put four Yamanaka factors into a somatic cell and reset the entire network, obviously those four factors are pretty important in the downstream network of transcriptome that they uh, reactivate would define a cell. If you're a geneticist, that would define a cell as being pluripotent. If this entire, you know, if all 30,000 genes look like a ES control from your IPS cell, it's, there's a good chance, since we know those programs control the phenotype of the cell, good chance you could call that pluripotent. So the transcriptome. There's another program, which is the epigenome, which I'll come back to in a minute. Should look similar, ES and IPS cells. Epigenome meaning the code, the program of a cell that's not dictated by the DNA sequence. So the modifications of the DNA, including the methylation of the DNA and the modifications of the histones, the epigenome. And lastly, let's get back to, um, to function. So the functional assay, there are different levels of stringency and weight for these assays. So I think you've started with maybe, let's say, the lowest functional level that can you take the cell in vitro and put it in media as you've been, we've been talking about, a media that might have it leave pluripotency towards making primitive streak in the presence of WNT, BMP, and activin with high activin driving it to anterior primitive streak and thereafter endoderm and looking at some of those endodermal markers and then taking that same vial and putting it in the posterior primitive streak media we talked about, a high BMP, high WNT low active and taking it towards KDR positive mesoderm and the downstream lineages that come up quite easily with time if you just leave those cells in media and they make <coughs> collagen programs and smooth muscle actin programs and fat droplets or beating cardiomyocytes that come up that's mesoderm and of course we talked about the propensity to almost by default respond to FGF4 induced or MAP kinase signaling in the presence of retinoic acid or, al or almost anything, just time to leave for neuroectodermal differentiation and make long neuronal looking shapes that are TUJ1 positive, for example. So if you've done those in vitro experiments, that would be function. That's um, differentiation. Two, three germ layers. <coughs> That's a functional test that you have pluripotent cells. A higher level test would be, so this is in vitro. A higher level test would be in vivo. What's the in vivo function of your cells? <clears throat> so this is where the mouse field really wins, right? So you have the ultimate tests that we talked about with mouse ES cells and now mouse IPS cells where you can inject the cells into a blastocyst, right? So if you take your cell made from the tail tip fibroblast of a black mouse, reprogrammed with the Yamanaka factors as Gustavo described to you, and you reach these colonies that are marker positive and you want to call them mouse IPS cells or mouse pluripotent stem cells, the proof that they're pluripotent in vivo is the ability to take those cells, 
inject them, let's say, into an albino mouse blastocyst embryo and plant the embryo in the foster mouse mother. 19 days later, the pups are born. When the mice get hair, you can see a patchwork of black and white coat color. And similarly, all the cells internally are, uh, are the organs inside are chimeric, are made of contributions from both the, the injected test cell that you now are comfortable calling pluripotent because you functionally proved, proved it makes a mouse chimera, right, in vivo. So chimera formation. But can you do that with a human cell? So uh, th that's a good question, actually. So, it's, so uh, we don't think of it as ethical to do that with a, a human cell, but you know there's new cell papers uh, now coming out where you can cross species, including getting some mouse, uh, uh, human, uh, human pig, or human other animal chimerism when you inject pluripotent stem cells into animal embryos. So for example, um, uh, who, who was the author? Uh, Bonte. Bonte had a new cell paper uh, addressing this topic. But for the most part, um, crossing species is difficult. There's very low efficiency chimerism, and we don't do this with human cells. This is a, an isogenic or, or same species kind of um, chimera formation, mouse into mouse. So the next level of in vivo proof that you have pluripotency beyond chimera, so you can have uh, partials, partials in mouse iPS cells that lack some of the markers that have rounded up that look good, that um, express some pluripotent markers, that express some directed differentiation potential, and you inject them into a blastocyst embryo, and they even make chimeras, right? So they're pluripotent, but they're not the same as ES cells. They're partials. They're not quite right. And those cells have a tough time going germline. So the next layer of stringency here would be um, either high-level chimerism or the ability to have germline transmission. Germline transmission. Germline transmission means that experiment we just did where we took the black re tail tip fibroblast reprogram to what we'd like to call pluripotent stem cells injected into the albino house, host mouse uh, blastocyst put into the foster mother, making pups that are black and white, if some of those mice have egg or sperm contributed from the injected black test pluripotent stem cell, now we can breed that mouse together with, say, an albino mate. And the next generation, some of those mice are black. And that's evidence, classically, of germline transmission, well known with ES cells, and now uh, published repeatedly with the engineered equivalents IPS cells. So if you have a partial or something that is pluripotent but not uh, meeting all the stringencies of what ES cells can meet, they will tend to not go germline. <clears throat> so we're going, in a, again, through different levels of stringency here of calling cells pluripotent functionally from an in vitro test to a chimeric test to a germline transmission test. Yeah. So the highest, le so the question frequently comes up, can you take a cell and uh, you know, maybe it takes time or generations in the mice to really reach this pluripotency state so that by 19 days they can make egg and sperm. They're not quite pluripotent. And another generation, they're clearly pluripotent, contributing to, to this, this next generation of mice. But in 19 days, in one generation, can you have that injected pluripotent stem cell make the entire mouse? And the answer is yes. This is well known for ES cells that the technique of tetraploid complementation, which basically involves but before you inject the cells, the test cell, that host blastocyst, we, we shock it with electricity and make a tetraploidy of the blastocyst, that blastocyst will be able to form the placental tissue but will not be able to develop into the whole organism or the mouse. And so the injected cells are the only cells that can make the mouse. And in 19 days, in one generation, you're injected IPS cells from the black mouse will make an entire black mouse, and then the placental tissues for that developing mouse will be formed by the tetraploid cells. So tetraploid complementation, tetraploid complementation has also been published for IPS cells establishing that they really can behave just functionally just like ES cells and make an entire organism very quickly in the right environment of the developing blastocyst embryo. OK, so these, there's a problem here, which is I'm describing to you mouse on mouse experiments, and you're learning all week about human pluripotent stem cells. So how do you know they're pluripotent beyond the markers we're discussing? 
beyond the array or RNA-seq that says they're very similar to ES cells beyond the epigenome that you can profile. You can certainly do the directed differentiation, which you've learned about through multiple germ layers. But the, in, the only in vivo tests we really uh, have widely published for human cells functioning in vivo is a teratoma assay. So that basically means you take an immun immunodeficient mouse, so it won't reject your human cells, and in a matri gel plug in various convenient compartments in the mouse that you can remember, go back to, and find your cells, the cells in vivo over many, many weeks, such as nine weeks, can form little, they live, <coughs> proliferate, form clumps of tissue that you can analyze, and when you section through those analog, those, those tumors, these are benign growths called teratomas, because they have tissue contributions in them of the three germ layers. You can find lots of glandular structures, you can find even hairs developing sometimes, you can find cartilage, so there's mesoderm there, there's glandular uh, structures that include endoderm and gut markers and uh, um, muscle fat and neuronal structures. So that's a teratoma that shows three germline differentiation in vivo. So ter this is not the highest level uh, data, right? You can have partials even behave in a pluripotent way. It's not equivalent to ES cells, but they will form teratomas implanted into mice. So this is a low stringency test, but it's what we're stuck with in vivo for human cells. Do we do teratomas on our lines? I think early in the field everybody is required to publish with teratomas, and we've come to learn that it seems to be a very non-quantitative assay. It doesn't tell you the real quality of your IPS cell. You can have a poor line, makes a teratoma, a partial that makes a teratoma, or an excellent uh, IPS line that by every other measure, it looks the same as an ES cell and makes a teratoma. I don't know that it's any better or worse, a bigger or better quality of ter teratoma. These are not scored quantitatively. They're qualitative tri-germline differentiations. But that's what we use for human cells in vivo, um, but not routinely. I don't, I don't think most journals require that routinely. But if you're starting this program in your lab, making IPS cells, it's a good idea to do a teratoma just to convince yourself you really made pluripotent cells. Any questions at this point? Okay. So an interesting, uh, in the in f few minutes we have left, I think an interesting um, topic to discuss is what makes the cells so special that are pluripotent. One component being the network and the transcriptome that gives us this functional property. And it's really interesting to conceptualize why cells with the same genetic sequence will behave so differently, and um, how do cells know, why do cells remember if you start off with a poor day zero cell, or you don't quite make endoderm properly, you, you messed up and it's a little bit posterior primitive streak with too much BMP and Wnt, and then you try to make it into lung, why will it resist becoming lung if you haven't gone perfectly through foregut endoderm with this IPS cells? Why can't you give it a Wnt stimulator, BMP agonist, retinoic acid and have your cell from the previous stage, your human IPS-derived cell, form lung. Why, why is that? Why is that? Why shouldn't, shouldn't a, why do you think that is? Why, sh I mean, shouldn't a cell just respond to, if you know the signaling pathways that encode lung specification or Wnt, BMP, and RA, as they seem to be, why can't you just take these cells and give them the growth factor? Maybe they require co-stimulation of multiple growth factors. Okay. Or what if we give them all the, the, the right growth factors at once? Maybe it didn't go through the specific stages that it needed to beforehand the, to produce the precursor. That's right, yeah. So you have to go through the specific stages to be competent to respond to the next stage of growth factors, and you can't do it all at once. For, for, for lungs, you don't seem to be able to do it all at once. And one of the biological explanations uh, that we're interested in studying using these model systems is the concept of cellular memory. How does a cell remember what, what it's competent to be or what, its grand, what cell fate decisions its grandparents went through? So uh, the epigenome is, seems to be uh, one possible mechanism that explains cellular memory. The marks on the DNA are histones that are handed down 
through each generation of cells that render them competent or incompetent to respond. So if we look at undifferentiated stem cells and pro profile them, there's some interesting papers that have that come out several years ago, one from Bradley Bernstein's group published in Cell, where he found that if he starts to profile uh, histone marks, uh, the way the DNA is folded and wrapped around the nucleosomes, um, he's, there's some classic histone marks we, we know of in the epigenome. So the third histone protein in the nucleosome, the fourth lysine in the third histone, HCK4, can be methylated or acetylated, and it's certain patterns are predictive of a locus being generally open. So the beads on a string, the DNA wrapping around the nucleosomes are a little wider, more open, euchromatin, and that tends to correlate with a locus that's either active or poised, about to be active. So it turns out that trimethylation of H3K4 is a mark, let's say around a promoter region of a certain developmental gene that's associated with euchromatin and uh, ability to activate that locus or actual expression of that locus. And in that same third histone protein, the 27th lysine, H3K27, uh, a methylation of that mark is associated with the, with the opposite. So the chromatin there at that locus would tend to be closed and off and the HCK4 trimethyl would tend to be more open and either um, expressed or, uh, or poised. Okay, and this is, happens fast, these changes in development, uh, as opposed to the more permanent uh, changes, I think, that come up, which is the DNA <coughs> methylation that tends to be closed and off for a locus seems to be a later mark or a more permanent mark. So in Bradley Bernstein's paper, Profiling Embryonic Stem Cells, he found uh, his contention was that there was co-expression of both the off and on market many developmental transcription factors or promoter regions of those transcription factors. So that's a really interesting observation. The transcription factors were, might be off, they might not necessarily be expressed, but the promoter region in front of that locus, NKX 2.1, by the way, as we find is one, one of those loci that has both patterns has a kind of a two-part signature off and on, and he named that bivalent. So these bivalent loci, his contention is, is a property of these pluripotent stem cells, especially for developmental transcription factors and their promoters. H3K4 trimethyl together with H3K27 trimethyl. And then as the cell exits pluripotency in response to the growth factors we're telling you about being endoderm, if it's still competent to become lung, uh, it maintains this dual expression around the promoter of NKX 2.1 and many other loci. And as it exits that, let's say, foregut endodermal state to be something else, or if it decides to become mesoderm in certain factors versus the lung factors you're seeing, it will resolve the state from bivalency. So um, you might have day zero bivalent state having both marks at a certain loci of interest, to commitment and specification, and let's say uh, day 15, NKX 2.1 positive cell would tend to assume univalency of this locus, NKX 2.1. And we've, we have some data on this in mice uh, in vivo and in uh, mouse ES cells as they differentiate to NKX 2.1 positive endoderm that if you're going towards lung, you assume, you, you express the locus, so you pick up the mRNA of the locus, and the histone states of the proximal promoter region of NKX 2.1 tend to assume H3K4 trimethyl, an active state, open, expressed, and they lose this bivalency, or H3K27 trimethyl goes away. It's the opposite in the same cell taken to mesoderm, right? It's not, the mesoderm has no business ever expressing NKX 2.1. It's not going to be a brain, lung, or thyroid. And it will tend to resolve the bivalency towards only HCK27 trimethyl and lose the H3K4 trimethyl. And it might also, you know, permanently, as a mark of permanence to give up that state, might assume DNA methylation in that promoter region later. But for the most part, these developmental times I'm talking about don't have, at least for NKX 2.1, much change in DNA methylation that we've picked up. It's about the rapid changes in histone methylation developmentally. Now, why is that cellular memory? When the cells divide and the DNA is copied, 
the histone modifications enzymatically are also copied and passed down, and so the daughter cell immediately assumes uh, the, the epigenomic program or marks that are similar to its parent, and that's how it remembers the sulfate decisions of the parent. So if the parent has NKX 2.1 promoter region that's DNA methylated or has assumed a repressive state, that daughter cell is similarly going to have a repressive state, and now you can give it all the goodies of lung specification, those factors, even cure BMP and retinoic acid given to the cell that has repressed the key locus and many and all the other thousands of loci that need to be competent is now incompetent to respond. And that's why you need to profile your cells, know the quality of your day zero cells, and then monitor your endoderm because CKID CXR4 is easy to check. You're not doing a global chip seek epigenomically on your cells each time, but CKID CXCR4 will tell you if you're on track with these other programs towards being competent. Any questions about that? Okay. Yes. Have you looked um, at what happens when these uh, NKX2 positive cells go either to lung or thyroid, like an additional step as far as either histones or methylation changes? Yeah, we, don't, we haven't studied that. We don't know, but we assume because they give up their competence. If they're becoming thyroid, they don't want to uh, respond to lung factors and vice versa. We assume that that cellular memory is similarly being passed down through epigenomic changes, but we haven't profiled what those changes are or how they encode the uh, competence or not uh, after you become thyroid or lung. Other questions? <clears throat> Is methylation restrictive? So once you're methylated, then you can't go back to... We don't really understand how reversible the marks are if you can treat things with uh, HDAC inhibitors or uh, force the cells through treatments to be, um, become demethylated or methylated, how reversible are, if a cell's gone wrong, can you rescue it or not, is an ongoing, area of ongoing study. I think the main problem is the specificity, how you can specifically target one side, right? These drugs yeah. are... I mean, in theory, everything's reversible, right? I mean, that's what Yamanaka proved. You could have the most, you can have the most advanced uh, restriction, differentiation, and patterning, and provided the cell can re-enter cell cycle, that's all you need. Then, in the presence of these four Yamanaka factors, the whole, not, it's not only the network that's activating, the whole chromatin changes towards this Bradley Bernstein's bivalent state, or, you know, the, the whole methylation, methylome, and the histone marks start to look more like an ES cell and leave behind their somatic cell. Okay, so let's talk briefly about whether that's actually the case or not. How similar are ES and IPS cells after this reprogramming is done, both in the transcriptome and the epigenome? We talked about the markers being similar and the function being similar, and this is a, a contentious area. There's a lot of papers coming out. Um, we know the cells are very, very similar, functionally, transcriptomically. Now there may be, is there any cellular memory left in an iPS cell of the starting somatic cell is the question. And might that, if there is memory, it would probably be epigenomically encoded. <clears throat> so several years ago started a flurry of papers, some claiming the somatic cell of origin matters because there is cellular memory or epigenome is not completely erased during reprogramming, so the iPS cell maintains a trace of memory of the starting cell and will not be identical to the ES cells. Most of those early studies are done certainly on pluripotent cells, but at very early passages. So, at early, so pre-programming takes time, is the, is the point of these early studies and the controversial literature associated with them. The cell may round up. It may look very much like a pluripotent cell, in including the ability to make a chimera. But if you restudy the cell over passages, there comes a very helpful paper in the mouse literature um, from Conrad Hedlinger's lab that basically tracked after 16 passages, the cells look virtually indistinguishable functionally and otherwise IPS cells to ES cells. So af the, 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 the reprogramming continues with passaging and over a long period of time the cells look more and more similar to ES cells. Now his lab was the first to pick up that if you compare head-to-head -head mouse ES and IPS cells, do all the marks go away? Some of the marks 
that persist in, in, in his lab's data are uh, methylation differences in some imprinted genes, particularly from one locus in mice called the DLK1 DIO3 locus. It's a classic imprinted locus studied in mice. And these uh, differentially methylated regions, the DNA methylation patterns that encode whether the paternal or maternal allele is expressed in, and, they're, and they're passed down through all the generations of cells, which is the paternal and maternal allele. These marks were messed up in the iPS cells compared to the normal ES cell marks. In other words, the, the iPS cells in, in this one location, the genome looked like a paternal disomy. There were, both alleles were methylated and the, these differentially methylated regions weren't, um, were aberrant, if you will. So that's one subtlety that might distinguish iPS and ES cells, and I think that literature has been questioned in a subsequent paper by Rudolf Yenisch, and uh, it remains a controversial area of whether there's any trace of memory of the somatic cell origin or not. So I can share with you our experience, because you want to know, should, if you're making lung, maybe you should reprogram a bronchoscopy specimen of airway epithelium from your patient rather than getting the sample of blood that we've been suggesting to you this week. So what we've done is we find very similar profiles regardless of the cell of origin of our iPS cells. And in mice, using our NCAX GFP reporter, we've tried to reprogram cells that were tracheal basal cells versus, that's endoderm, right, and tail SNP fibroblasts using that from a mouse that has our NCAX GFP reporter, and either at early or late passages from those iPS cells of those distinct origins, we find in our medias similar endoderm competence, regardless if you come from a tail tip fibroblast iPS or a base tracheal basal cell iPS, and similar competence to similar efficiencies in this isogenic format to form NCAX GFP positive <coughs> cells. So we're not finding functionally much evidence of memory of somatic cell origin, and I think it's an open, very subtle, nuanced debate in the field. What's that? The paper. You didn't publish no, no. it. No. So uh, that's, that's, uh, that's what we can say. We're not going to be definitive about there's zero difference between ES and IPS cells, but for the relevance of most of your projects, that, those differences are a subtlety that's very debated and hard to track and hard to study. And most papers that claim there's a difference have not controlled for passage number. They've, they've not done late enough passage numbers. Or in the human models, most papers haven't controlled for genotype, have, haven't done isogenic comparisons. I have a question. So if, if we believe that um, early reprogrammed cells may not be completely reprogrammed. Right, like they're, they they're not, right, bit, yeah. Then, but, but obviously, in general, you want to be working with relatively early passage number cells. For the karyotype. Yeah. yeah. So I guess, where's the happy medium in terms of not going too soon? Yeah, I don't think we know long. exactly the answer. But any time you, th I mean, that you don't have to keep overexpressing the factors, the loci mm -hmm. that are reactivated endogenously for the Yamanaka factors will, will complete the reprogramming. So I think the reality is get your passage archived early with a normal karyotype. Yeah. And the time it takes you to thaw the few passages to get your experiment up and running, yeah. the cells seem to be uh, pretty good. If you want to memorize a number in mouse work, we say passage 16 is probably has data behind it that that would be a good passage to reach before you do your differentiations. OK. okay. okay. Yeah. In reality, soon, you, know, you take your vial, and then you have to gene edit it to make your report or fluorochrome knock it, and before you know it, your passage 30. So uh, the, we don't know the happy medium, and we especially don't know it this week because we have a new Nature paper that says P53 mutations mm -hmm. that you can't detect by these G-banding methods. That's right, requires sequencing uh, emerge with passaging. So we, we have, that's an important question, and we don't have an answer of where the perfect time to freeze is. Yeah. It should resolve, right? As all the genome-wide sequencing costs come down with time, we should be able to reach a consensus of how good or bad are the cells and what would be the right passage number to freeze them. I, I believe in a nature paper out of 140, only five, he found mutations, correct? Or all of them were mutated? I thought it was five. The problem is that two of those five are very, very, very widely used, oh. H1, H99s. But most of the 140 were not mutated, right? I, I don't know the number. I think that, I think <coughs> that the, the, the finding was five, and then the whole day, so, so is that good or bad? It's only five is good, but there, there are five out of 140 that has clear mutations.
So from, for people that are using IPSS regularly, do you normally characterize them? And what do you use if you do characterization? Well, for me, we, we got ourselves from ATCC that came right. with a carrier type. So uh, my approach at least was just to freeze down a large band right. and from it. And if you have a carrier type from them and you froze it down within a few passages, you, sh you should be fine. I mean, it's not free to carry type. It costs money and time and effort. And if you, you know, so there's a there's a balance between being reasonable and being perfect. And we're not. A, it's not always financially feasible to be perfect, right? So as long as you have a carry type within a few passages, that's better than than average for sure. So we test like flow. We do SSCO four, then op three four, and also alkaline phosphate, and then send out the carry type thing. Yeah. You do it by flow. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. a very quiet, I mean, that's a better way, right? So mm -hmm. there's various ways to profile these. You're learning the staining kit way today, which is easy, but by flow, you'll get nice quantitative per cell data. Very good. Yeah. So I have a question about, like, when you start the differentiation, so we freeze down cells, so we do the characterization be before we freeze down. So when you take out of the freezer, how many passages you have to do before you start the experiment the differentiation. Do you have to pass it a few times to start the differentiation? We don't know how many times you have to pass it. It's not too many, but okay. I think as soon as you have the cell numbers you need to get going. So, okay. I mean, I think there are extremes, like you wouldn't want to start your experiment the day after thaw. That seems obvious. I don't think you want to keep the cells in. We prefer our guys not keep cells in culture more than three months and because things drift. And, uh, but so. Not many passages. So the first passage is okay. Like if I thought the cells, I can start like the next passage. Then Maybe. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we don't know the answer. So if you're doing a new differentiation protocol that's not working for you, maybe you, maybe that would be an explanation that the cells aren't healthy enough and need a few passages to recover. How do you know? Well, I mean, markers are a good place to start. If you thaw a vial in a passage later, they're only 50% positive for alkaline phosphatase, then you probably, are, the cells are trying to tell you something. Maybe they need a few more passages to be healthy and profiled properly before you start. So we don't, that's, we don't have an answer to you, but uh, too long, three months, more than three months, probably not good, and too fast, thawing and expecting the cells to be ready in a matter of days, too, too fast. What about morphology, Marianne? What do you think now, once you have a lot of experience, do you think morphology helps or, or you cannot trust morphology just by looking at the colonies in the microscope? What does it mean? Well, if you think that when, when you say these colonies look good or bad, uh, what is that? What that means? Well, I'm trying to... Um, what is something that you're learning also this week, right? Yeah, so we haven't seen a lot of differentiated IPS cells. Um, I try to give them cells that look better, you know, more characteristic morphology of IPS cells. But today we're going to look at more of a mix of um, different cell lines that have been differentiated <coughs> as well. So. so it takes time and pattern recognition, and one of the goals of the course is you have a personal contact with Marianne, so if you take a photograph of your cells mm -hmm. at home and send it to her, she could, she could comment if you're having trouble. And the, the best thing is to have somebody on your campus who's experienced down the hall, et cetera, that you can drag to the microscope and say, well, is this okay or not? You know, usually uh, cells after, soon after passaging for the next couple of days don't, don't look great. You know, they look too loose and their edges aren't perfect and those often recover with time. Are there particular cell lines, established IPS lines, that you find are particularly good to differentiate to endoderm and, and, and thereafter? Yeah, so, yeah, uh, that's a <laughs> complex question. So, um, yeah, we haven't talked much about line-to-line -line variation. So, <clears throat> so if you make IPS cells that are all profile okay, or if from the mouse you even have tetrapoid complementation, does that mean they all perform equally in the directed differentiation, including to end endoderm to lung? So. Definitely genetic background makes a big difference for reasons we don't understand, obviously. There's been a lot of work in this area. But the observation stands that if you take 
two different clones. This is mouse or human from two different individuals or in mouse two different strains and you try to make endoderm and lung, you get very, very variable different uh, efficiencies. And the field is complicated because if you just take the same clone and redifferentiate it the following month, your efficiency also wobbles. So what's responsible for the differences in efficiency? So we performed an experiment uh, with Paul Gadu that we published a few years ago where we made multiple clones from different people. And we did blood differentiation. And so if you take three clones from the same individual, and three clones from a diff uh, other individuals, and you put them all through blood differentiation and score them, or you put them through transcriptomic analysis, uh, let's say in the undifferentiated state by PCA, uh, you tend to cluster by genotype. In other words, the three clones from that one person tend to behave and have expressed transcriptomes that are sim more similar to each other than to the three clones from the other individual. Now, there are occasional outliers, and those outliers are extremely interesting, and you sequence them, and you find copy number variations and key genes that are responsible for that. But in general, so this is not a global rule, but in general, the differences in differentiation efficiency, we believe, based on that experiment and other data, are due mostly, not entirely, but mostly to the genetic background. So there must be modifiers elsewhere in the genome that tell the cell maybe how much basal, uh, you know, uh, nodal protein to be expressing, and that gives it a totally different efficiency than some <coughs> other clone. That's an important point. So you got to check your line, and uh, I think if you're learning lung differentiation, you made a new line and it goes to NKX with 10% efficiency. Does that mean you're doing something wrong? No, it may be fine. It's about getting the line that you know maybe has a published efficiency or has NKX GFP in it that you know is supposed to be 35% most times, and then if you're differentiating it and every time it's 10%, you have a problem, right? So uh, getting a lung competent line as your control in the beginning is really important rather than a new untested line because it can it's hard to predict its efficiency. One of the great untested questions in the field is with these new uh, naive medias, you know, Austin Smith's equivalent now developed, let's say, by the Yenish lab or Jakob Hanna lab when you do these inhibitors that bring the human cells to basal pluripotency to a naive state, is this going to remove all these biases, right? So. So other than genetic modifiers in the, the genome, the, the, the counterpoint, the other possibility is the cells have nothing to do with the genetic background, the modifiers. It's that each line is slightly developmentally different in, towards epiblast or towards earlier, later, and so it's a ready lineage biased developmentally to neuroectoderm as, or the other clone to, to endoderm. And so the inhibitor, the naive state medias should resolve all that to similar efficiencies and rescue lines that previously made poor lungs. So those experiments remain to be performed and we don't know why they have different efficiencies. Okay. It's going to be a problem for you guys. You guys are going to have clone to clone differences and even when you have a clone that works, you're going to repeat the experiment and get frustrated because your graduate student gets a different efficiency the next time. They're not doing anything wrong. This is just what happens for reasons we don't understand.